So I, I want to ask you, a, start off with a, with a question. Okay? So imagine that there is this um, grad student and he loves board games and he decides that he, he loves them so much that he wants to do a GWAS on board game, love of board games. And so he knows that you attended the Russell Stage uh, Institute of Social Science Genomics and so he goes to you and says, hey, I have this great idea, I love board games, I want to do a GWAS and I've gathered a bunch of data, um, you know, like several thousand people and says, do you want to help me out with my GWAS? What's the first thing you're going to ask him about? Sample size, right? So good, you're listening this morning. We're good. <laughs> so yeah, so first, first thing you'd be concerned about is that he's probably way underpowered, right? And so, um, so then he's, uh, so you say, okay, this is maybe not a great idea unless he gets a big sample. And let's say that he then goes and he says, I'm going to, um, I, so, so I, I did a power calculation. I gathered my sample big enough and I've realized that I, I am well powered. I, I have, you know, 80% power to detect effect sizes at a p-value of 0.05, so I'm, I'm good, right? Are we good? No! Why not? The winner's curse. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> why else not? <laughs> multiple yeah, multiple hypothesis testing, okay? So two, two big topics from Dan's thing this morning. Uh, power and multiple hypothesis testing. And so those are two things that I, that I hope that, you know, two, two of the big topics that you come away having learned from here is that those are major, major concerns that you can carry um, into all of your research um, and especially into the research you're doing in genetics. So another one of the issues that maybe is worth thinking about is, is Winner's Curse. And so let me just give a brief introduction about Winner's Curse. So our, our grad student who loves board games um, also loves to win. And so he, he has some dice, and, and one of these dice is, is, is loaded, which means that when he rolls it, it tends to have a slightly higher value than, than the other dice. But he accidentally has mixed his dice together. So he has some fair dice, and he has one loaded die. So he's like, well, I need to figure out which one's the right one, and so he rolls his five dice, and this is what he gets. Um, which, uh, so, so just looking at this, which, which die do you think is most likely to be the one that's loaded? If, you just, if I made you pick one. It's probably the green one here, the, the six, right? And you're saying that because, oh, well, it's, it's the biggest one. That's probably the, the most likely option. But then let's say I ask you, okay, this dice, it's, it's a loaded die. Um, what do you think the expected value of the die is? Well, I mean, like, it's a six now, so maybe that's a good guess. But, um, but, but probably not, right? Because we'd think that if, if, the, if the expected value is actually four, we would want to probably choose the highest number, but, um, but actually taking the value of this number, it's gonna be biased upward because the reason we picked this one in the first place is because it was the biggest one. And so this is kind of the idea behind Winner's Curse, and so we're gonna talk about how this applies in, in our genetic settings. And so, um, so this is, this is, you know, to be a little more technical, you know, most of the time when we're doing GWAS, we do something like OLS. And one of the nice properties about OLS is it gives you unbiased estimates. This is great because, you know, we want to know what the effect of the SNP is on the outcome. And so doing an OLS regression should, should give us, an, on average, the right answer. Um, in, in practice, this doesn't seem to be the case. So when we do like a GWAS or really any type of analysis, and we're trying to find which um, SNP or, or which... Uh, kind of covariate is associated with the thing and, and we see that some of them are significant. When we take this into a replication sample, the estimates that we get in our replication sample tend to be systematically smaller than they were in the discovery sample. And it's for the same reason of this dice thing. We're picking our, our SNPs or our covariates based on how, how big of a number we got as the estimate. And so as a result, um, on average, these are gonna be, they're gonna be too big um, this, is, this is related to regression to the mean, right? Because in the replication sample, we're going to get something a little closer to the mean effect, and so we're seeing things that are a little smaller. Um, so, Winner's Curse, I'm saying, is, it's relevant for all research. So, we're, we're, you know, I'm going to talk in context of gene stuff, because that's, that's what we're here for. But these types of principles are, are things that you should keep in mind um, always, uh, no matter what. So, when are, when are cases when knowing that your estimates are too large due to winner's curse, um, when, when are reasons that knowing that might be helpful? So 
So like, when, when would it be good to have a guess about what the actual effect size is rather than this, this biased estimate? Yeah, yeah. So why why is it bad that it's too big? Like, what in what case are we going to want to use it? Mm -hmm. maybe prediction, maybe? Yeah, yeah. So so maybe prediction because they're going to be too big, and so these biases will be systematic. Yeah. You want to find replicated, so figuring out what sample size you want to replicate. Yeah, exactly. So if you want to say like a replication, and we want to do one of these power analyses, the power analyses that we've been talking about this morning are a function of what the true sample size is, and so if you use the the true actual, oh sorry, true effect size. Sorry, true effect size. Um, so if you actually used your estimate of the effect size in your discovery sample to try to get a sense of how big your replication sample needs to be, you're going to pick a replication sample size that's too small because your, your, your true effect is likely to be substantially smaller than the one that you estimated. And so, so these, are, these are some settings where these, these uh, corrections that we're going to talk about today and these, these principles um, are important to keep in mind. Um, so in a GWAS, there's two types of selection that are going to cause us problems. Um, I mean, I guess Isu is going to talk more about what, you know, what this is exactly, uh, exactly how this is done later. So this is going to be a teaser on some of her topics, I guess. Um, but first, we're, first thing we do when we're doing a GWAS is we, we do a selection, I call it selection by threshold. So when we do a GWAS, we say, um, I'm only going to take seriously SNPs that have a p-value of less than 5 times 10 to the negative 8. And so for, for a constant sample size, um, that just means that we won't keep any estimate, any, any beta estimate that is in some, some distance from zero, right? Because the standard error is if we hold the, the, the width of the standard error is constant, then that corresponds to a very specific beta, beta threshold. And so, so when we do this estimate, we're saying, okay, I only, I, only, I only care about the SNPs that I estimate to be large, and so as a result, we're going to um, be biased upward. And so to get a sense of, of why this is, what I've plotted here is, so let's say we have a real SNP, and the true uh, effect size of the SNP is, is 0 0.1. And so the gray area here is the distribution of the effect size estimates that we get um, if, if, if we're doing OLS. And so, so OLS estimates are you know, asymptotically normally distributed around the truth. And so this is a normal distribution with a mean 0 0.1 and, and how wide this is has to do with our, our sampling variance, so how big our standard errors are. But then once I condition on the estimated effect size to be greater than maybe, maybe 0.2 is the, is the threshold that's relevant for our sample size, we see that there's a lot more weight over here than there is over here. And so what's this going to do to the bias due to the winner's curse? Who thinks it's going to go this way? Who thinks it's going to go that way? Yeah, we're right. Yeah, so the bias is because there's just a lot more weight up here than down here suddenly, even though the, the true effect size is going to be 0.1, on average our beta estimates are going to be bigger than that. And so that's, that's how s selection by, by the threshold can, can cause us problems for winner's curse. Uh, the next issue is one that Dan talked about. So, so when we do it, oh, do you have a question? Yeah, on the last slide, what's giving us a distribution of beta estimates? Like, is it just because there's like measurement errors? It's sampling variance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is, which is like what our, our uh, standard errors are trying to capture. Um, okay, so we, we do our GWAS. And we find that in, in this, this narrow region, we see a big spike in our Manhattan plot. And there's maybe like, you know, 12 SNPs that are all right next to each other that are all genome-wide significant. Now, we don't actually believe that all 12 of those SNPs are, uh, correspond to different signal, right? Even if, if just one of them was the causal SNP, um, but then they're all highly correlated due to LD, then, then we probably think that all of those SNPs, I mean, it's likely that all of those SNPs are just capturing the same same causal signal. And so we don't want to double count that. We want to have like a number that represents how many like regions we're finding. And so we say, okay, I just want to pick one. Of these 12, I just want to pick one. Which one are we going to pick? Yeah, we're going to pick the one with the smallest p-value for the same reason that when we were trying to find the loaded die, we picked the die with the, the largest, the largest number. Sample way beyond any samples you've gotten to distinguish between 
you know, the, 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 the five SNPs that are all in LD, or, or, or do, is there a decent amount of... Are you talking about trying to distinguish between the sets that are in the same peak? Yeah. So it depends on, so if you believe that there are actually two causal SNPs, um, and let's say that the, the correlation between the two, I'm probably like banging this mic, um, the correlation between the two um, is just like 0.3. So that might be high enough that we, we clump them together um, afterwards in, in kind of the simple procedures that we use here. Um, but if we were able to run those jointly, then we might have enough power to detect, to detect both of them. And so sometimes we try to do that. But let's imagine that the correlation between the two SNPs is like 0.99. Um, then you obviously wouldn't, wouldn't be able to separate, find both of those. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so the type of thing that you're trying to describe is generally called fine mapping, um, if you're like looking up the literature, and there's, there's ways you could do that. So one of them, like the kind of probably the first stab naive way to do is, is what you're just, you could run a model and include all 12 SNPs in, um, and, and if your SNPs are not too, like you know, if they're kind of correlated but not too highly correlated, um, then you may have enough power to find that. There's, there's other tricks that you can do, um, like if you have, like I've seen people say where they, they take two samples that have slightly different genetic like LD structures and so the pattern of the spikes in that region are going to be slightly different and you can use that to triangulate maybe where the causal one is. But there's a, this is a big, there's a big literature on trying to identify which SNP is the causal SNP. You can also use other information that you know about the biology, right? So, so a synonymous mutation, so a SNP that doesn't change the protein that's produced is, is probably a lot less likely to be the causal SNP than one that's um, leading to changes in the proteins that are being produced. So in a locus, I, I, okay, then that gets to the question of, in, in a typical locus, I mean, how many like, sort of things that could be the right kind of gene are there? I mean, how many, how many kinds of whatever protein coding genes per locus are there? I mean, so it depends on, on how, how well powered you are to begin with, and also the the LD blocks um, are larger and smaller in different, different areas of the genome. So there, there are some areas where it's you know, a pretty narrow band and, and so there's maybe not very many SNPs, but there are also areas of the genome that are known to have really long range LD. Um, and, and in cases like that, it's gonna have a lot more SNPs and, and it's gonna be more and more as you get, um, as you get better powered. Um, so I mean, that's... It's, Yeah, yeah, if you want to do this strategy of trying to triangulate, then, then yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you have to make other assumptions about the betas being the same across your populations, but th that's not so crazy. Um, okay, so uh, back to winner's curse. Um, so yeah, so we, choose, we choose the SNP that has the lowest p-value, and that's not totally crazy because, you know, the one with the lowest p-value, you, you think that maybe a SNP, there's the true SNP somewhere, and there's a SNP next to it that has a correlation of just 0.5. And so this one that's only correlated 0.5 is on average going to have a smaller effect and so you're going to be lower powered, you're going to have higher p-values. And so you know, this, this approach again, it's, it's, it's not totally crazy, but it's again, it's going to introduce bias because we're selecting, we're choosing the biggest one and by introducing this, this uh, rank element into it, it's going to push the bias of our, of our estimates up. I mean, just as a general principle to, to um, you can think about when you're doing this is that you know, when, when we're doing a GWAS, we kind of have two things that, two, two activities that we're trying to do. We're trying to um, do s like SNP selection, gene identification, but then we also may want to do um, estimation. And, and in principle, you can't use the same data set to do both. Um, and so that's, you know, why, why we have things like the winner's curse is because we're trying to do both of those things in the same data set. Okay, so we, we know that winner's curse is a problem, and so we want to fix it. 
And so there's, there's a few different things that we could do. I mean, probably the, the kind of simplest, simplest way to do things is, is a replication, right? So as I was saying before, you can't use the same data set for gene discovery as you, as you can um, for estimation. However, let's say we do a first round um, and we find like 10 SNPs and then we go into a second data set and we use that to estimate. Well, OLS is unbiased. And so in this case, um, we should be getting unbiased estimates in, in the second round. So in, in a practical sense, when, why, why might that be a, a costly way to try to deal with winner's curse problems? What are we losing by doing that? Yeah, you're, you're losing a bit of precision because like, let's say you have this replication data set. You could have just thrown that replication data set into your first stage and gotten more precise estimates. And so um, even though this is, this is in, you know, in principle a more clean thing to do and it seems nice and it will give you unbiased estimates, um, you're doing it at the expense of, of gene discovery. Um, so that's, that's, that's maybe something to, to also think about. And these, you know, I, I think in general the benefits of replication are, are so large not only for resolving the winner's curse, but for dealing with um, some of these replicability um, issues that we face with, that, that it's, it's usually a good idea to have, have a, a replication sample when you're doing these kinds of things, but, um, but, that is, but it is a cost that we're, we have to deal with. Mm -hmm. So one thing I was interested in is how large the replication sample Yeah, so to do that, you'd want to do, okay, so, so you need to do a power calculation, right? Um, and so if you're doing it, if you've already run your first stage analysis um, and then you say, okay, well, these are the effect sizes I'm getting and then you try to do some correction for winner's curse then, then you could just do like a normal power calculation at that point and then, you know, and answer that question. In fact, you're going to answer that exact question in problem set three. You'll do a power calculation for a replication study. Um, but then it's, it's a little bit more tricky if you're trying to make all these decisions before. Let's say you have, you know, 100,000 people and you're saying, okay, I, I, I would like to do a replication, but 100,000 is all the data that I got. And so how, how much should I set aside um, in the first stage in order to, to do in the second? And it, it um, I mean, in general, your replication sample can be much smaller, right? Because to do gene discovery, you need to reach these p-values of five times 10 to the negative eight. Whereas in the replication, if you're only testing like 10 SNPs, then um, after you Bonferroni correct, you're, you're only looking for p-values of 0.05 divided by 10, right? And so, um, so it depends on how many SNPs you think you're going to get in the first stage. Um, but these are all, you know, you can think through this, come up with sort of a, a reasonable, you know, what you think is reasonable and what you think a worst case scenario is and then make the decisions based on that. Mm -hmm. I mean, ideally it would be random. In practice, we don't do that. Um, we usually we just like, we'll choose one cohort and call this our replication cohort and then hope that that cohort is um, like the effect sizes between the discovery and the replication sample are the same. And I mean, that's not a crazy, oh, go ahead. But maybe I misunderstood the question, but I think, that I think maybe he was asking how do you split, how do you decide the optimal split between discovery and replication? Are you asking about size or which individuals? I was asking about which individuals. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, so ideally, it would just be totally random. So then you can be sure that they're, you know, that you're drawing these individuals from kind of the same population. Um, but, uh, but that's you, you can't you can't easily do that with the meta analysis very well because you don't have the individual level data, which is why we resort to this. Just pick one of the cohorts that we do have individual level data for, um, and uh, you know, and as long as that cohort is, is the same as your discovery, you're fine. Mm -hmm. Partly has been driven by the fact that these newer cohorts are appearing later. But it seems like, priori, let's say that you actually had the data, you would actually split it before the full sample, and what you would is actually have in each cohort a, uh, a part of the sample that you leave without testing, on which you would then test, and then do another meta analysis. Right? Yeah, that yeah. seems to be like the correct way to go about it, right? Yeah, but again, that's kind of hard, because then you have to trust your cohorts to do this complicated thing about setting aside, I, I, right? I, so the I, I, Okay, yeah, yeah. You're talking about yes. unbiased as if it's really unbiased, right? So, so we didn't have time to bring this up before, but let's say 
you, you were talking about the UK sample now, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, if I had the full, like if I had all the individual level data in one place, I can actually put fixed effects and interaction pick with the fixed effects with, of the genes, right? So to I, identify heterogeneity, to take uh, account of the institutional differences. You can't do it here because you are splitting it. So when you get it, you actually are already getting an estimate that's the interactive uh, effect of what specific. Oh, if there's a cohort interaction. Right? Okay. Uh, so even though it's in principle it's unbiased only if it's true that there is no fixed effect of the cohort interacting with it. Right? Yeah, yeah. No, and that's um, and that's true. And so there are things you can do to try to measure how much heterogeneity there is. So they'll, they'll make these things called forest plots, where you plot um, the cohort level effect size, um, and then you can do a test of whether or not in expectation those are all equal. Um, those tests tend to be kind of low powered. Um, but it does, it does try to get at this idea of like, is there, is there more heterogeneity in our, in our GWAS estimates across cohorts than we might expect? Um, you know, in general, in general, it's pretty safe to assume that across cohorts, the effect sizes are, I mean, again, it's, it's um, like in, in EA3, we were trying to look at a bunch of characteristics and see if we could predict when there would be heterogeneity. And there is suggestive evidence that maybe birth cohort was relevant. Um, none of the other things we looked at seem to be important. So I mean, like, assuming that it's the same is, is probably a pretty good approximation in general. Well, that being said, we do know that mixing together different cohorts leads to worse performance. So there, there surely is some heterogeneity. Okay, yeah, that's a good point too. So there is some. Um, there, there is some. Not, not only that, like in, in the example that you were giving, like when suddenly like you have more SNPs becoming significant, it can also be because, let's say, those SNPs are, are able to actually affect the outcome because of institutional things, which would be part of the heterogeneity, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if there was one cohort driving the whole thing, it would be pretty apparent. Um, yeah, but, but, but that requires throwing in and out, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, replication, we, uh, I mean, we, I think we're going to talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so replication is one way to solve for winner's curse. Um, there's also like several other methods that you can do. Um, I'm, you know, you, you can like, if you know what the bias is, you can just uh, invert the function of the bias or there's this thing. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, Bayesian methods for correction because this is what we tend to do in practice and um, they, they have nice properties that um, I think are useful. Okay, so, so by Bayes' rule, so we say, what, what's the distribution of, of the true beta? We want to know what the true beta is. And so I want to say, what's the distribution of the true beta given that we see a specific estimate and given that that estimate is significant? Well, for, I'm going to first say that you know, if we know what the sample size is, then once we know what beta hat is, then it's either significant or not. So you don't have to actually condition on that. Um, and, then, and then I'm just going to apply Bayes' rule, and you get this thing here. And so this is what's the distribution of the beta hats given the true beta. Um, and if we know what beta is, the only variation in, in beta hat is due to sampling variance. And so we know what that distribution is. Um, this thing here is the prior. And so we need to make an assumption about what the distribution of the effect sizes, like the unconditional distribution of the effect sizes are. And so you know, we'd have to make a judgment call here. Um, so we might assume that effect sizes are normally distributed. We assume lots of things are normally distributed, and we'd be quite convenient in this case as well because, um, you know, if this is normal and this is normal, then the math is is uh, really simple. Um, a funny problem with that is if the betas are distributed normally, what is the probability that the effect of any particular SNP is exactly zero? That that the SNP has no effect on the outcome. Yeah, it's exactly zero. I see Peter back there. Yeah because it's a continuous distribution, you're, you're saying that there is absolutely zero probability that the, the, or, yeah, the, zero probability that the SNP is, is perfectly null, um, which means that every single SNP affects the outcome maybe just a little bit, but every single one affects it. Um, that that, that is maybe seems a little funny. There are, there are perhaps SNPs that are like unrelated to the outcome that we're interested in. And so we might want to use instead a distribution where we say, okay, let's, let's assume that there's some probability that the effect is actually zero. 
and that otherwise it's drawn from maybe a normal distribution or, or something like that. So something like that's called a spike and slab distribution. A spike because if we were to try to draw the PDF, um, we'd have a big spike at zero to correspond to the probability mass there, and then the slab is, is the normal part. And so, um, so spike and slab is also simple enough that we can usually do, do nice things with that. But, but I'm just highlighting we need to make an assumption about the true effect sizes if we want to do a winner's curse correction here. And what we assume is going to affect how much, you know, the type of correction that we do. Um, this is just kind of a technical note, just saying that um, doing this doesn't actually solve all the problems. There's like this mathematical result that uh, there is no winner's curse correction that will result in unbiased estimates no matter what the true value of beta is. And so even this Bayesian thing, sometimes we're gonna, our correction is going to overcorrect and sometimes it's going to undercorrect. Um, the nice thing about this Bayesian result though is on average we're going to be okay. In expectation, this correction is equal to actually the, the true value of beta, but, but you, shouldn't, you shouldn't take individual level SNP effects um, literally because each individual SNP may be biased and we don't really know exactly how. As a whole though, if we look at the set of SNPs together after doing the correction, we maybe can say things about you know, big sets of SNPs. Um, and so, oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so yeah, um, yeah, in general, we estimate the parameters of the spike and slab empirically, and so I think that the plan is to work through that tomorrow. Okay, so it's not, you're not trying to impose some ex ante from just what you knew before. Yeah, yeah, so we'll take the whole set of data, we will, um, you know, using like maximum likelihood or something, fit it to the spike and slab and then use that. So it's like an empirical Bayes approach. Okay, so just quickly. Um, here's, here is what happens when you correct. So, so for the EA2 paper, um, we, we said, okay, well, we have these estimates. We know that they're biased and we want to correct them. And so, you know, so here's our, here's our top SNP. In the, in the naive, you know, our, our estimate from the GWAS analysis, we estimated an effect size of about 0.1. Um, using a, a normally distributed prior, we said, let's, uh, let's correct based on the assumption that everything's normal. And we get that we think that the actual effect size is, is 0.06. And then when we replicate, so the replication should be right on average, we get something that's, that seems kind of close. But, you know, so, so our correction in this case um, seems, to, seems to have gotten us something pretty close to replication. For these other two SNPs, it didn't seem to do as well. And again, I, I, don't, I don't know the degree to which this is because we um, are just looking at three SNPs and, and this, you know, we're only right on average. So we're looking at a small number of things. Um, uh, it's not that far. That's, that's like, true. That's like 14% difference, and that's like 15, and that's like 30, so. Yeah, I mean, something that I do find, you know, so I was talking about how in Winner's Curse, we always get smaller estimates afterwards, and we're only getting, so here's the, here's the discovery, and here's the replication, and we only get smaller estimates actually for this one and for this one. This one actually went up in the replication, but it's just, I mean, our replication's kind of noisy, so I don't know that we can make big claims about what's happening on average here, but, but just giving you an example of... This is also for EA1. This is right. EA1. Oh, that's right. This is EA1, and, and two of these are college hits, and we're looking now just at years. Oh, is that right? I think so. Okay. Well, there we go. That might explain it, too. Uh, I'm just showing you bad pictures. Let's see if I have a better <laughs> uh, example. Well, okay, so this, is, this, is, this should be a little bit, little bit better, but we should update this slide. I think that this is in of several slide decks, but... Um, okay. Well, it's still a good example. It's, yeah, it's, a good, it's a great example, but you can't compare <laughs> on the right and left. <laughs> okay, so, so we, as we talked about before, one of the things that you might want to do these winner's curse corrections for is in, um, if we're doing a power calculation. And so I want to know how well powered our replication is. Um, and uh, Okay, so this is, this is just what we've been saying before. We have our GWAS estimates. We need to correct it. We need to pick a prior. Um, and we're gonna use this Bayesian thing we talked about. So when we have, this is the EA2 paper. And, and these examples, again, we, we assume that it was a, a Gaussian, which, which might, not be, um, might, might not be the right thing. Um, we see that, so we can say, what's, what in expectation, um, after we do our winner's curse correction and we do our power calculation, what fraction of SNPs do we expect to have a p-value of, of less than 0.05? Well, we do all our math and we see that we expect to see about 40 of them to replicate, uh, to, to replicate with a p-value that's small enough. 
Um, in fact, we, we actually have uh, 52. And so this is what Dan was saying, that our replication record is, is perhaps slightly better than what we would have anticipated. And that, that was based on, on um, this calculation here. We expected 40 given our correction, we had 50. Um, we did the same thing. So this paper is the GWAS of subjective well-being, depressive symptoms, and neuroticism. For this one, we use this uh, spike and slab prior, which maybe we think is more realistic. Um, in this case, of the 19 hits we found across these three traits, we expect uh, you know, nearly 17 of them, 16.7 of them to replicate. Um, in the end, we got exactly 16 of them to replicate. And so it seems, seems to have worked pretty well um, in this case. Uh, how impactful is your choice on this prior Yeah, so I mean, it, 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 could, be, it could be a big deal. Um, if, uh, if we choose something that's totally wonky and, and wrong, our power calculations are going to be way off, right? And so that's why this maybe spike, this is why we switched to doing the spike and slab thing, because we think that's going to maybe be a better approximation. Like we don't necessarily think that it's actually spike and slab, um, but we think that maybe a spike and slab is, is, is a good fit for the world. It's close enough that our power calculations are reasonable. Um, what types of changes? Um, to, to your, uh, so your spike and slab, like your, your standard error, the, the priors. So you, uh, like, so, okay, so, so we, could, we could move from spike and slab to a totally different class of distributions. So that'd be a big change. We could also, you know, in the spike and slab, we have a parameter about like how much probability is in the spike, or what's the variance of the normal distribution of the slab. Yeah, so I mean, uh, I mean, it probably wouldn't affect much. I mean, we, we try to be principled. So we actually estimate those parameters. And so we're not, um, we, we can't be accused as much of saying, oh, we just chose the parameters that we like the most, because we have this more principled approach of picking them. Um, no, I've, I've not really done a lot of sensitivity analysis. I mean, because obviously we're estimating those parameters, and so we have them with noise. Um, in practice, uh, if you want to know kind of what the difference is between what, what happens to your correction from Winner's Curse. In, in a normal case, if this is um, beta hat, and this is beta hat corrected, um, when you assume a normally distributed prior, um, the, the correction tends to be linear. You, you end up shrinking everything by like a constant factor. Um, whereas in the spike and slab, it tends to look a little bit more uh, like, this, so um, small effects, so this is kind of the 45 degree line. Um, so small effects are going to get shrunk a lot. So anything that's kind of in this range, you're going to shrink almost to zero, whereas the larger effects, you're going to shrink a lot less. And so the more weight that you put um, at, at zero, it's going to make this hump a little bit bigger or smaller. And so it, um, it depends on kind of how much confidence you want to have on something that's, um, you know, not zero, but still kind of small. Yeah. Um, I think this might be a completely naive question because I have very limited understanding of mathematics. But um, one of the things that you mentioned about trying to get both the estimate of, or, you know, of the data and um, identifying the SNP, at least that's not ideal from one sample. But I'm just wondering um, how similar is your winner's curve corrected data to the sample in your meta-analysis that contributes to the Do you think, do you think there's like a... Wait, say that again? So if you, in your meta-analysis, you have a whole host of cohorts that yep. you want to do different truth to your common estimate. And let's assume you sort of correct your uh, top SNP for winner's curve. Is that quite similar to, say, what you would ex what the sort of uh, estimate by in some of your smaller cohorts? Because you don't contribute all that very much. So in expectation, um, all of your cohorts should have the same estimate, just with more or less noise, depending on how big they are. Um, and so I, I think that when you just pick a random cohort, the, you know, whether or not it's going to be smaller or larger relative to the true effect size um, shouldn't, shouldn't matter, right? It should be, it should be mean. The mean of it should be the truth, and then 50% that it's higher, 50% that it's lower. Um, uh, so yeah, so I, I don't, but like, you know, if you were to set aside, whatever cohort you set aside is, is, is going to be in expectation right once you've picked the SNP. 
So if you're not doing selection, then each of your cohorts should be, should be, should be fine. Mm -hmm. Is it the case that uh, sort of like the more well-powered we are, the less we have to worry about limit curves? Um, yeah, yeah. And that, uh, yeah, and so that'll be reflected in, in different ways. For, for this one, the better powered you are in your GWAS, um, the steeper this line is. So, so as, as you get infinite power, um, this goes up to the 45 degree line. Um, you know, and you have the same, same kinds of things here. As you get infinite power, this kind of bump in the middle shrinks towards the 45 degree line as well. So that's true. Okay. Um, great, we talked about this. Okay, so just in summary, um, you know, you, you shouldn't use gene discovery and estimates for, this, for the same data. Um, if you want to do that, um, to take it and to do something like a power calculation, it's probably good to do one of these corrections. You're going to get some practice doing that in, uh, in problem set three, so you should all be really excited. <laughs> and, um, and I think that we'll also kind of go over it uh, tomorrow in one of the lectures. So um, that's winner's curse. So, should, so this is the shorter lecture. Should we take a break now and then do a long one after? Should I get started on the next topic? I don't even know what time it is. There's a clock. So you voted, someone voted for break? Is that, did I miss here? No, I went to ask for break. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> uh, okay, we'll do the, uh, I have a question. What do you use these for? So it's not that the, if you do the polygen scores, you're using these unbiased estimates, but you're doing this for these uh, predictions. So funny story. The, um, when you do, uh, when you're creating your scores, um, like, so you'll often use something like LDPRED, which is doing effectively the same thing as this. But, but yeah, we, yeah. Um, but mostly I think about this in terms of, yeah, doing power calculations. Um, when you're doing like a correction for, um, like st when, you're, when you're trying to test for stratification, uh, like a way you can do that is by looking in, in within family sample. We'll talk about that the next hour, but if you want to talk about how well powered you are for, for that kind of test, you need, to, you need to have a guess of what the true effect size is. So again, you need to correct um, so that you know. Mm -hmm. This is kind of along the lines of the polygenic score. So another thing is if you, you know, are calculating a polygenic score and you want to do it in estimation in your sample, but your sample was in the original GWAS, and so you have to run the GWAS without that sample in there mm -hmm. because you're afraid of winner's curse. Um, how much, I mean, have you guys looked at, like, for example, the health and retirement study, say it's, I don't know what percentage it was of the EA, but say you're taking that out, redoing the meta-analysis, I mean, should we expect these polygenic scores then to be more or less biased based on, you know, how big of a chunk you're taking out to then rerun the sample to then put in your own sample? Yeah, so, I mean, the reason that you don't want the sample in if you're making a score is, um, is more to do with overfitting, although maybe it's a related thing. I haven't tried to think of how they're... I think it's kind of related to winner's curse, isn't it? Because you would expect the polygenic score to predict really well if you were in the, if you were in the actual meta-analysis. Yeah, I mean, it feels like they're related, related concepts. Um, and so, yeah, so I get, if, you're, if you want to do prediction, then you, you do have the same question. Um, when you're doing prediction, you can probably get away with smaller replication sample size, right? Because if you're just trying to replicate a single SNP, those are just tiny, tiny effects. Whereas if you want to replicate the score as a whole, you know, with, a, with an R squared of just a few percent, you can, you can, you're well powered to, to detect the score in, in just a few hundred people, so. Taking out samples that aren't the HRS, or what happens when you yeah, cheat yeah, and you leave the HRS so you in? Have, you have ten different, say you have ten different cohorts in your GWAS, and each of them wants a polygenic score, so mm -hmm. you have to go back and rerun the meta-analysis without each of them in there. Mm -hmm. Have you looked at how different that, how that affects the meta-analysis estimates of the betas, and whether, you know what I mean, how taking out each of those samples affects the, the So there's a relationship the between the discovery sample size and how predictive the score is. So that's, that's kind of one thing it, it feels like you're talking about. So, so you want to have as large a discovery sample as you can if you want to maximize the predictive power, but you don't want to include the prediction data because of these overfitting things. And so, so should I expect that if I was a, had a, was a really large percentage, my cohort was a really large percentage of the original GWAS, and now you have to take me out, that my polygenic oh. score is going to be more biased. Yeah, and this is a, this is a problem. Um, yeah, like, like for example, let's say that you wanted to do um, some analysis in the UK Biobank, um, but the UK Biobank is, is half of EA3, 
E, the EA3 data, like once we, once we get the full thing. And so the scores that like we're talking about in the HRS are going to be a lot more predictive right. in, yeah. um, in HRS, which only requires removing a tiny bit. Yeah, right. so that's, but, but these are like, yeah. Is that a concern then, I mean, for these cohorts? I just, uh, um, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's like, you know, you have, to, you have to decide. I mean, in principle, if you're going into the UK Biobank, it's because you need um, a really large sample to answer whatever question you, you'd like to answer. Mm -hmm. I think that you had an answer in one of our site conversations that for, for the UK Biobank, you create a policy and explore where for each bit of sample is based on the other four bits. Yeah, so you could do something like that too. Um, your standard errors are a little bit wonky, but um, uh, so, so, so the idea is that you could use 80% of the UK Biobank to create a score for 20%. And then leave out a different 20% to create the score. And then, then you have a score for everyone in the UK Biobank that's not based on their own data. Um, I, I kind of like that idea. Um, I don't know of anyone who's done it. Um, but it, it does mean your standard errors are weird. Um, and we'll talk more about uh, polygenic scores on, on Monday, so I don't want to spend too much, too much time on this. But. Mm -hmm. Where, which typo? Will not be uniformly unbiased, but they will be un. Oh, yeah, let's just say unbiased, probably. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry.